This is the Clean Energy Show with Brian Stockton and James Whittingham. Hello and welcome to episode 60 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week is logging with electric trucks green. French lawmakers ban short flights. Free solar charging for EVs. And I get angry about nuclear. This and everything else as we discuss the week's news in clean energy. Brian, you and I are vaccine brothers now. Yes, so you finally got your first shot. Yes, at a drive through clinic that opened for 54 and 53-year-olds on the same day. My partner is uh, 53, so we both went together, spent six hours in line. Uh, best six hours of my life because it was for something good. <laughs> it wasn't stuck at a border crossing or something. It was... Uh, yeah, there was a light at the end of the tunnel, and that was life. I would not die once I got the vaccine. So I got the Pfizer. You and I both have the Pfizer for what it's worth. I don't care. My side effects were pretty mild. Uh, just very slight achiness and fatigue, almost not noticeable uh, a lot of the time. I did have a nap, and that sort of cleared it up a bit. Yeah, myself as well. It was just a little bit of fatigue, felt a little bit weird, and, and my shoulder was sore for... For a couple of days. Yeah, the, the actual injection uh, shot, slot, <laughs> hole, was yeah. a sight, was uh, sore on me. I didn't put anything on it. I thought, what the heck? I'm happy to have that soreness there. And I know some friends who've got the AstraZeneca who have had some pretty bad uh, flu-like effects for like a day and a half. Yeah, and I think with the Pfizer, the, the side effects come more on the second shot. So we have uh, that look to look forward to. But of course, here in Canada, we kind of have a shortage of... Uh, vaccines, so they're extending the time between the first and the second dose. So it could be another uh, couple of months before we get our second dose. Yeah, and uh, I'm I'm okay with that. If it's I I I'm actually approve that because uh, I would rather get my shot now than a month from now. How do you feel? Yeah, and I read an article that kind of explained it, and the three week gap was always kind of arbitrary. Like they really just had to pick a gap because there were yeah. things were moving so quickly. So they picked three weeks, and that's what's been tested. But quite often, these two-step vaccines are done quite often three, four months apart. So that might have been the normal course of action if this had not been such an urgent uh, issue. So it's it's possible waiting three or four months might actually uh, might actually be better. We'll we'll see. Yeah, I, my uh, shingles vaccine was three or four months apart, and uh, I had to remember to go back and get it. Yeah, I almost forgot as well. Yeah. Did you get the shingles vaccine? I did, yeah, a couple oh, of years good. ago. Did you have any side effects? Because I did. Uh, no, no, it was fine for me. So, Brian, uh, I was talking to you this morning, and then I went down for lunch, and uh, something horrific happened. Oh, no. You might say, James, what could possibly happen when you're nuking your lasagna and putting <laughs> a couple slices of bread in the toaster? <laughs> well, uh, there was this horrendous noise from outside my house. Oh, my. And I looked down, and... Uh, a giant avalanche from the solar panels on my roof had collapsed. Like, it seemed like the whole, we, we just got like 20 centimeters of snow, very fluffy, wet snow here, 15 or 20 or something. Yeah. You look outside on my table, my patio table, and it's quite thick. It looks like it's that thick. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that's wind blown or what, but there was quite a thick, wet layer of snow and it all came down at the same time. Um, and it scared the living urine out of us. Now. I need to know what time it came down because I woke up this morning and I looked across the street and there was this overhang of snow on a house across the street that was hanging down about a meter from the roof line. Like this whole oh, yeah. chunk of snow was just slowly inching downwards. And so <laughs> I, my partner and I started taking bets about when it was going to fall. And uh, I bet 11 a.m. She bet it was going to be sooner than that. And uh, I can tell you, it, I, w I wasn't watching it the whole time, but I looked at 12.20 p.m. and it had fallen. Wow, that's uh, hilarious. And uh, we don't, we're not used to getting wet snow like this. We're a dry snow climate. Yeah. And we don't usually get big dumps of snow in April. We do get snow in April, but we're not big dumps. So uh, I might have to do some sort of dy dynamite avalanche control or something. Brian, I'm concerned that someone legitimately would have been hurt. Like, uh, it was loud. Yeah. And my, my daughter was upstairs and she came running down because she heard something. She's on the far side of the house. So she heard it on the roof moving 
And my son was like, jumped out of his chair and it's like <laughs> the whole, we've had chunks of snow fall before and I've joked about it blocking out the sun briefly because it does, it, yeah. you know, it's like a bird going in front of the sun really quick. Well, this was a lot of snow and I'm not, I'm not convinced that I wouldn't have been seriously hurt or something. Like I, I have questions about that. It might've just been hilarious or it might've been bad. <laughs> I don't but know, but it was a lot of snow. What time did it happen? 1235, my friend. <laughs> okay. Good to know. So that's, uh, that's a time when, uh, when we, uh, solar noon here is like 1259, one o'clock, we'll, we'll call it. And, uh, so that's the peak of my solar production. Um, now having said that, I don't think I have any solar production on my panels yet. I think that was, you know, what I was hoping for is this wet snow to all roll off at the same time and act as a sponge, like a wet sponge cleaning the dust off. Yeah, mine are uh, pretty so dusty. I, could, uh, I need the same thing. I don't know. Does rain clean them? I mean, generally they're manually cleaned, I think, in, on professional solar farms. Yeah, I think a good rain would do it. But yeah, if it all slides down at once, then uh, yeah, it's, that should do it. I've heard about that helping uh, before I got my solar panels. But uh, um, I'm just loading the web page now and I have zero production. So there's still more snow up there. Weird. Which means... I'm going to advise people not to go into the backyard. Oh, and also because... it's it's cloudy out too, so that's not helping. Well, I, I still would get about 20% on a day like... I got 20% on when it was actually snowing. Yeah. When it started snowing, it was cloudy and snowing. Uh, so I should be getting uh, like at least 15%. I'm looking out my window. It's a, actually a fairly bright cloudy day compared to what it has been. Probably 25%, 30%. Now, I want to get back to our new segment called Vax Chat, and tell me about uh, the drive through vaccine clinic, because that's what we have here, and it just it's slowly opening up for different age groups. It's kind of going down lately, kind of one year per day. So how did that work at the drive through uh, Well, like I said, our day came up, so I was there at 7.30, an hour before it opened, and there was a lot of people there. My wife was not convinced that all those people were waiting because it was a whole parking lot. Like there's a, an arena there for hockey games and things and events, and it was pretty full. And uh, Scott, uh, Paul Dornstotter, who's a producer at CBC, who I worked with before uh, many years ago, was there tweeting about it to CBC when we were listening on the radio. And he was up, you know, a few rows over. I could see him taking panoramic pictures off of his truck. And um, yeah, so there was uh, all these rows we parked. I was worried that we would have to be constantly going in a, you know, a drive through line for six hours, uh, inching forward. And, you know, that would be tedious, but yeah, they had a very good setup where they parked us in rows, 13 deep. There was some 40 rows of 13 deep cars. Some people had multiple people in the cars and everybody was my age. I just could not get over at all these 2000 <laughs> people who are my age. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and they look so different. Some of them looked like old men. <laughs> you would, they look like old retired farmers that you would see on coffee row in a small town. Mm -hmm. And, uh, those are my people. Mm -hmm. I'm that person now, you know, I'm sure I would have thought of them as old before, but you know, it's, it's, well, I got to tell you, aging has been rough on me because I've got the kind of face. I always looked, uh, young. I always looked younger than I was like people would have guessed my age and they would always guess younger. And then I, I hit my forties and suddenly that's not the case anymore. I'm going to tell you a story about my hair not going gray. Um, <laughs> I, I attribute it to never having a job. <laughs> <laughs> but I have older brothers who aren't terribly gray either, and they're 10 years older than me. But um, I, I think when I had my, my second child 13 years ago, my friend Jack accused me of dyeing my hair. 13 <laughs> years ago, and it still hasn't turned gray. And recently, my partner accused me of dyeing my hair. Because <laughs> she's been dyeing her hair. Yeah. And... Uh, I've put some stuff on my beard when we were doing the sabbatical. It took like two years to shoot that feature film. And I, my uh, sideburns turned gray yeah. on the second year. So to match them, I bought some uh, beard stuff at the Dollar Tree dollar store, which yeah. is probably killing me. And I darken it. And now I use it on the rest of my beard sometimes. But I don't dye my hair. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's just genetics. It's just, I'm not... I'm not good in any other genetic way. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> it's not like the rest of me is 20 years old. It's certainly not. It's 106 at best. But um, I do not dye my hair yet. I'm starting to see some gray hairs up there, uh, and I'm sure it'll go go quickly. But uh, 
yeah, it's just funny how people are mad. At, 13 years ago, my friend Jack accused me of dyeing my hair. And it wasn't even a good hair color. It was mousy brown like it is now. It's yeah. like, the, like a mouse's ass. It's not a particularly good color that I've chosen <laughs> if I was <laughs> doing my hair. But um, no, it's just a funny. Some some people look young and some people look 100 years old, you know, like they're all the same age. But uh, and, But most of them, I thought, also interesting were uh, well off, like middle class people. You're not getting your poor people coming out to these things, which is concerning. Uh, yeah. Because not everybody, um, you know, they all seem similar economically to me and, uh, or above, which is not hard. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, you know, we, we had relatives who didn't have a reliable car, so they weren't going right away. I think their muffler made a lot of noise and they were afraid to go. So they, they were actually vulnerable people too. They finally went. So yeah, six hours in line and we got in and um, the Prius, uh, you can reserve, we took the Prius because I didn't want to think about uh, range on my 100 kilometer leaf. So uh, I got in and I forgot to, to save up the electric range and I went into the building with the gas engine on. But you had a bit of a different experience with your partner last night. Yeah, right. So she took the Tesla to get her vaccine last night. It had just dropped down to her age group. And, uh, yeah, she drove the Tesla and when she drove into the building, um, and she parked, they came over to her window and said, okay, you know, turn off the engine. And she was like, oh, it, it's an electric car. It's already off. And, you know, they're looking at the screen and everything and, and they're like, yeah, but it's still on. I can see that it's on. Everything's still on. And she goes, no, 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 it's, it's fully electric. So the person asking had to kind of think about it for a second and think, okay, why are we asking people to turn off their cars? I guess, I guess it's for the fumes. So yeah, if there's no fumes, I guess you're fine. You, you know, you can, yeah, the car is good how it is. I had that problem at an oil change when we had their first hybrid and it went into EV mode. You can't tell it not to. Yeah. If it's warmed up, it'll go into EV mode. So I had the oil changed and they said, rev your engine to 3000 RPMs. And I said, <laughs> uh, I'm hitting the pedal and nothing's happening. Rev your engine to 3,000 <laughs> RPMs, please, sir. Uh, no, they did not understand. They also did not understand that uh, some cars have a uh, higher tire pressure than 33 pounds. They were adamant about that. Yeah, I, well, don't course, they look inside the door to get the right number, right? They don't, though. The jackasses, they just assume that all cars... Oh, God. These are not the smartest people in the world, Brian. I've talked about them before. They're just out of jail. Yeah. You know, and then they're going to work at the lube shops. You're horribly so Brian, prejudiced against people who work at lube shops. <laughs> exactly. Brian, I'm thirsty. I am also thirsty. So it's a good thing that we're sponsored by District Brewing, which is a brewery here in our home province of Saskatchewan. So unfortunately, if you live outside of Saskatchewan, you'll just have to ignore this next little bit. But uh, they're a sponsor of the show. They love clean energy. They're looking to reduce their carbon footprint. And so they came on as a sponsor. Um, they sent me their new Hazy Pale Ale, which is this terrific pale ale. So if you like a pale ale, uh, that might be one to go for. But yeah, they also have a delivery service. So we like to talk about that. It's bruiser.com or just look for District Brewing um, on social media. Actually, you might want to follow them because they're planning to give away some uh, beer soon to uh, listeners of this show. So I would recommend following uh, District Brewing on uh, social media. But um, Well, if it wasn't enough incentive to listen to our show, yeah. to our sparkling vaccine talk and everything else, wow. But uh, yeah, so for our listeners here in uh, Saskatchewan. So yeah, bruiser.com, they have a beer delivery service. It works fantastic. It's for Regina and Saskatoon. And uh, they're big fans of the show, so uh, yeah, big shout out to them, and, and thanks for sponsoring. Now, what do you write in? T what's the promo code? How does that work? Exactly. Yeah, they have a little delivery instruction box. So write the word environment, or just tell them you listen to the show. That'll probably work too. But uh, yeah, if you include the word environment in the delivery instructions, they'll send some kind of a free gift along. That's fantastic, Ryan. I hope that you can stay sober during the taping of our show every week, uh, if they're going to continue to send you pale ale. As long as you don't open another one. I mean, whatever you do, don't open another one. <laughs> I have a crush on the Volkswagen ID4, Brian. I, I, um, I can't stop thinking about her. Uh, last week, I played a commercial on the show. I really like the series of commercials they have. Uh, you can find them on Clean Technica. They're actually unlisted on YouTube if you go searching for them, but if you search Volkswagen ID4 commercials on Clean Technica. They have a story with three commercials. 
Uh, the EPA announced this week that the range is out. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so in uh, kilometers, it's 418 kilometers, and in miles, it is 260. That's pretty good. Yours is, what, officially like 403? Uh, yeah, your Tesla around 403, range, although range. they've recently upped it to about 420, so the, the Model well, 3 right. is now about 420. So it's about the same then, and uh, you ran into one problem in a s- blizzard, <laughs> yeah, snowstorm, although, cold weather wind. I will say, in order to get that same range, it is a much, much bigger battery. Uh, I'm trying to find here, it is a, mm, the size of the battery here. I'm not finding it, but it's a much, it's actually a much bigger battery, so the, the Tesla is more uh, efficient, which is nice. But yeah, I would call that, you know, 400 kilometer range. Of course, on the highway, it's not 400 kilometers. It's more like 300. And then in deadly cold or deadly wind, it's going to be, you know, maybe as low as, uh, well, I found out it was as low as about 170. Um, although uh-huh. with a Tesla, apparently they keep about 20 kilometers in the tank. Like once you hit zero, you still can go another 20 kilometers. So I think it was total probably 200. It was a very cold day going into a headwind, and it was basically just traveled exactly the distance between the two superchargers, going from Whitewood, Saskatchewan uh, to Regina, like 170-something kilometers. And, uh, you know, it was it was close. Yeah, so the worst-case scenario for an electric car is very cold weather, a headwind and traveling on the highway yeah. because it's the reverse of a gas car. You get less efficiency on the highway in an electric car and you got about 50% of your range there. So that's something to keep yeah. in mind. And uh, what's the website that people can look at if you're thinking about buying an electric car uh, that gives you real world range? Yeah, evdatabase.org. I love plugging that website. It's it's really good. They do actual testing and they do it in summer conditions, winter conditions. Um, cause yeah, it's, it's the highway city. Yeah. The one number that they give you for range, you know, you're going to get more than that in the city, but less than that on the highway. So last week we revealed the breaking news of the price in Canada and it came in at 45,000, which meets our criteria for the federal rebate of 5,000. And it was priced at 40,000 in the state. So usually that would mean, you know, 48 or 50 in Canada. And, and I can't get over this, it comes with stuff that the American model does not, that people in northern states are going to be very jealous of. It comes with a heat pump, which is more efficient way to heat your car and therefore adds range, because remember, you're taking range from your car to heat it. You're not using waste heat from friction in your engine like you are in a gas car. Uh, and it comes with a heated windshield and a heated everything else. You're, you're in a steering wheel, and your seats, uh, mirrors, uh, but the windshield is sexy. Like, I've never had a... The heated windshield. I yeah. don't know how they work. I, I want to look that up, but uh, yeah. No, that's weird. But I yeah, say. we're a little bit lucky with that federal rebate. Like they just picked a number out of the air, $45,000, and it, it, you have to have one model in the trim that is 45000 or less. So I, yeah, I think this car would be normally priced in Canada closer to 50000 but it's forty five minus five for the tax, and then, or sorry, uh, the, the rebate. And then, yeah, you got to add tax and delivery is still on top of that. So after the federal rebate, your cash in is probably around 45. But yeah, that's an excellent price for that car. I think that's great. And uh, it's got some problems, but a lot of them can be fixed with over the air updates reviewers are saying, such as a laggy infotainment screen and things like that. Uh, But it is, it's roomy. It's got good cargo space. It's not terribly aerodynamic. So it does have that... um, trucky boxy macho look to it um it's got lots of room for tall people in the back seats uh it's got cool mood lighting throughout the car which i actually think is kind of cool i don't know if i'd use it or not it's got a um, you know lights a lighting system on the dash that sort of uh tells you how to drive it'll tell you it'll flash red to stop if the emergency braking's coming on or uh, if you're navigating to the right, it'll sort of give you sort of a speak to you. It's, it's like close encounters of third kind. It will speak to you through a light bar and <laughs> communicate in shorthand. <laughs> um, but man, I, I want to send, I told my son, I'm going to send him to uh university in Quebec so he can buy me the car. They get 14 grand off, almost oh 20 grand with the federal one. That's, That's amazing. insane. I would... Why isn't everyone in Quebec buying an electric car? My son says, well, I just don't understand them. You cannot expect people to understand. Well, I get into so many arguments with my son. He's at the age where he wants to differentiate, so he takes 
opposing <laughs> views, which we'll get into because I'm going to speak about one of those opposing views in a minute. Uh, but, you know, all these cars for the ID4 are coming from Germany. We can't get the ID3, which is a hatchback, because they're only putting it to the European market right now. They probably will for couple of years or something like that is that what you heard yeah maybe in another year or so but then the id4 available like late summer something like that yeah in canada and it's coming so it's coming from journey but they are going to build factories all around the world including in the united states and when they do that they're talking about an even cheaper variant coming so i don't know maybe 300 kilometer range or something like that maybe three quarters of the battery uh at an even cheaper price which yeah, well, be... there was a story that came out a couple of days ago from a German publication that said that um, they discovered that uh, Herbert Diess, the current CEO of Volkswagen, had in fact been offered the CEO job of Tesla about four or five years ago. He was with BMW at the time and was looking to make a change and obviously ended up going to Volkswagen. Uh, but yeah, according to this article, and, and Diess or Tesla hasn't really confirmed this, but according to the article, he was actually offered the job and was, you know, close to taking it and didn't take it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe Volkswagen, uh, maybe they kind of know what they're doing. I hope so. I really do. Um, I hope, I was hoping that the ID3, you know, that uh, the biggest, one of the biggest companies, auto companies in the world to build on, you know, put that out. And uh, they've been talking about it for a few years now, thanks to the Dieselgate scandal. Yeah, I think you get three years of free charging, even in Canada. Yeah. Which we don't have that here, though where we live in the prairies, uh, but you do get three years of charging. That's not going to add up to a lot of money unless you live in a, um, say an apartment where you can't charge and you're only charging at a fast charger, then you could, you know, it would add up to like a thousand bucks or something. I don't know. Yeah. Most people charge at home. So yeah, the, the, yeah, the free charging is maybe not worth that much, so, but depending it's on It's a nice are. perk though. It's a oh, nice yeah. perk to think that you can take off. I mean, it, you're not spending a lot on an electric car going on vacation, but to think that you can do it for free is just a really nice thought. I mean, you had free supercharger miles, right? You went out to Vancouver. Yeah, used them to get to Vancouver. And I don't know, several years ago, like a lot of car dealerships started offering free oil changes with, you know, you, you buy a car, you get the first three years of oil changes. And, and uh, that always struck me as a nice little perk too. That's a nice perk because I hate oil changes. The worst. I mean, it's, it's, it's enough just to buy an electric car just for that reason yeah. alone. And the, I know there's somebody listening saying, what, electric cars don't have oil? No, they don't. They don't have anything. They've got all the battery and a motor, and that's it, people. Uh, there's nothing else to worry about. And by the way, yes, I do have my blood pressure monitor literally standing by, and I will use it later. So yeah, I know we my... have lots of blood pressure-inducing uh, topics today. <laughs> I just, I like the car. I think I, I won't be able to afford it. Um, my wife needs a, a new car to replace the Prius coming off the lease next year. So as we've, we're in the race of time of, you know, used vehicles aren't with a lot of range are not available. Um, and uh, she needs a car to replace. We got, we got to unload that baby. We can't buy it because it's it's been in two accidents. So I got to unload it um, with the lease. So we'll see how that turns out. But it's a, it's a nice car. And you know what, Brian? It charges only at 125 kilowatts. However... This is where things get complicated with EVs because you want to look at the charging speed, right? You want to be able to charge fast on the highway uh, because that can be a problem. Some of them take 20 minutes, some of them take an hour. And uh, this one is only 125, which is like half of the peak of what Tesla does. However, they're saying the charging curve is quite impressive. It goes from 5 to eight per 5 to 80 percent in something like uh, 20 minutes, something like that. And um, so basically it gets up its moderate charging rate and keeps it there where it is, you know, through all the percentages of the battery remaining. Whereas Tesla sort of peaks, I don't know, is it 40% or something like that? And then goes down drastically after that. So this is the charging curve is something you'll have to learn about. Basically how they're selling the cars to uh, people on the lot is saying it charges from 5 to 80% in this amount of time. So that's a good thing to compare it to, not worrying about numbers or anything like that. And not everything is going to be the same. Yeah, I think that's decent. I found the size of the battery pack. So to get your 418 kilometers, uh, it's an 82 kilowatt hour battery pack compared to uh, only 50 uh, in the Tesla. So that's the other thing to consider. I think 125 kilowatts, like you say, in a good charging curve, I think that's going to be totally 
adequate, but, um, you know, with the Tesla to get the same range, you've only got to fill up 50. There was this, you've got to fill up 82. So that in itself will mean it'll take uh, quite a bit longer. So Brian is logging with electric trucks green. Yeah. So fantastic story here out of, uh, Canada, Vancouver Island. There is a logging company that has ordered, uh, some Tesla semis. They've ordered three of them. And uh, apparently the way the logging works on a place like Vancouver Island is often up in uh, the mountainous regions. So that's why I thought this was an interesting story, because what they're talking about is getting these Tesla semis, driving them up the mountain, loading them up with logs, and then using regen braking all the way down the mountain to the point where they think they're not even going to have to plug these in to charge them. They're uh, literally just really? going to charge them the first time. <laughs> go up the mountain, you know, you deplete the battery going up the mountain, but then you load it up with all these heavy logs. And if you're going downhill all the way, uh, with you just use regen and yeah, you'll have a totally, uh, hopefully they think full battery at the end of it. That's kind of what they've been doing with mining trucks, uh, yeah. in mining pits, big, heavy electric trucks. So they've been, um, yeah, they, they do charge them, but not, you know, like overnight, they don't have to keep charging them or anything. And, uh, yeah, that's, there's some amazing things. Plus, you know, brakes on stuff like that are going to go fast when you're carrying a load down a mountain constantly. Yeah. The regen is a sweet benefit to that because that'll save you money and time and, uh, downtime. No, I imagine. And, yeah. Uh, the brakes are probably a huge, uh, uh, expense with semis. You know how we talked about, um, uh, Tony Siba and, uh, super, energy is it called super energy super like power su i think he was calling super it. power that's when you overbuild green electricity to meet your needs but some days there's too much of it so you give it away well that's actually happening in the uk a uh, good energy company there is introducing a quote unquote flash window to allow ev drivers in britain to charge for free when there is an overabundance of green energy so um yeah, they're calling it a zap flash. The goal of the program is not only to take advantage of green energy, but also to reduce the strain on the grid. So you're, I guess it's it's like uh, incentivizing people when there's lots of extra green energy, that's when you'll juice up your car uh, and for free. So it'll be available in different days with customers receiving 24 hours notice of when it will open. So they'll say, hey, it's going to be sunny tomorrow. It's going to be windy tomorrow. Uh, that you'll get a thing on your app saying, we expect that you'll be getting some free charging tomorrow, so beware. And you'll stop after Fantastic. work. And uh, during, the during the summer months, it'll take place between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. and shifting to 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. between October and March. So I guess they're relying more on wind in the wintertime, uh, and you'll be able to do it at home or perhaps, uh, no, not sorry, not at home, but at the charging station. So that's that's a, a real world uh, example of something that we're talking about when we talk about future stuff on the show, 10 years away stuff, while well, it's happening. And that's what you do with that free electricity if you overbuild green, uh, next, very, very cheap green stuff, is, uh, well, you can make hydrogen and store that, and there's different things you can do. You can desalinate water, um, make factories run for free. Yeah, well, uh, that would be amazing. I would totally leave my car plugged in. And, you know, just wait for an alert and, oh, you get the alert, boom, you just press the button on your phone to start the car charging. That would be amazing. Brian, it's time for What Do You Think? What do you think? This is the segment where I save things till I get to speak to Brian because I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. So I asked Brian, what does he think? And I have uh, to say, James, bless you because you're the only person that cares what I think. <laughs> our listeners are clamoring on your every word, Brian. Oh, yeah? I don't know really? what you're talking about. They're hanging by their nails, <laughs> waiting for your next words. Um, so where do you think we are with solid state batteries? Because Rivian has decided that they're not going to make their own batteries for the Rivian truck that's coming out this June, and people can now are starting to get their reservations finalized. Uh, but they're using Samsung SDI cells until solid state comes. So they're sort of banking on solid state and then they'll make their own. Uh, what do you think? Well, I've been saying this for a while. I don't know. I don't think solid state is all that important. Like what's important is getting this stuff out at a massive rate. So if you are 
mass producing batteries and, and Tesla's going with the 4680 cell, which, you know, they think that they can ramp up to massive production at much lower costs. Um, I think that's kind of more important because as soon as we do get solid state batteries, and I think it's coming, uh, you know, they're going to start at these higher price points. So yeah, maybe they'll be initially for aircraft or something because they're higher density, but I don't know. I have a feeling we're maybe 10 years away from them being low cost enough to, right. you know, supplant what we've got going already. There is a company that claims they're putting them in, in some Chinese made buses. Uh, Toyota says 2025. That all remains to be seen. Um, so are you sitting down? Do you have a high back on your chair? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm about to give you a whiplash. The impossible Whopper has made its way to Canada, Brian. <laughs> Fantastic. Are you going to? Are you going to try it? Ah, uh, sure. I would. I would try that. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you? Have you? Do you occasionally enjoy a Whopper? I do occasionally enjoy a Whopper. I, I quite like the Whopper Junior. Yeah, the Whopper's a bit much. You know, it's yeah. a big piece of charred meat, sort of burnt around the edges in my Burger King. Um, there's the occasional Wednesday when my wife brings stuff home from work and, uh, or not from work, on her way home from work. So I looked it up. It's only 10% more than a beef whopper in Canada. You know how we're talking about how these things are going to displace and eventually become cheaper? Um, yeah, so it's, it's actually a cheaper percentage upgrade than even A&W, which is like a dollar or 80 cents, um, last time we, we went. It wasn't much. It's getting less and less. And then... What we're going to see happen, if you listen to previous shows, is that uh, fake meat is going to become cheaper and more customizable and uh, more enjoyable over the years. And you, if you want a beef, the beef is going to be the upcharge. I predict a beef Whopper will be 25% more expensive than a fake Whopper uh, in five to 10 years. I agree. And yeah, I've been, when I... Go to A&W, I pretty much always get the Beyond Meat Burger now. I've, I've gotten to really like that one. So, um, yeah, I, I, that's great. I'm looking forward to that. My partner's have been having digestive issues with them, so she's been eating just the Beyond Meat uh, when we go to A&W. The kids love A&W. We've actually over-fast-fooded them. Yeah. And <laughs> it's one approach to healthy raising healthy children. Is it's like them making them smoke food. a whole pack of cigarettes so they, exactly. they won't start smoking. Exactly. We've done that over 15 years. We've over fast fooded them, and now they don't like fast food. But they do enjoy <laughs> ENW. Good parenting. <laughs> yes. I shall write a book about it. Canada <laughs> may play a big role in the Apple car as Magna and LG have a joint venture, uh, and it's nearing a potential deal, says a report. Magna is a car parts manufacturer, well known in Canada. Family who runs it was well known in Canada and even involved in politics. So what do you think? Do you think that the Apple car is still a thing and it could be made in Canada? Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't really, I sort of saw the headline, but I didn't really read it. Um, these Apple car rumors are starting to get a bit uh, tiresome. I want them to finally uh, announce something for God's sakes. Like this is, this is taking a long time. Is there value in an Apple car? Yeah, I'd say there's huge potential. I'm, I mean, they've got to make it happen, but... Um, it, uh, you know, especially in an uh, autonomous world, um, you know, I, I think Apple likes the idea of controlling the whole ecosystem. Um, you know, it was sort of controversial when Tesla didn't, Tesla doesn't allow like Apple CarPlay or Android Auto in their cars. And uh, a mm -hmm. lot of people I think are, are turned off by that, but I think it's the smart yeah. move for Tesla. It was, it was a dumb move really for all these auto companies to allow Apple and Android into their cars. Like they're essentially giving away part of their business. Um, so, you know, it makes sense to me that you'd want to control the whole experience and, and, uh, yeah, the, the, the legacy automakers really just, uh, let that one go. They, they probably shouldn't have. Toyota was very reluctant about that. Um, and they still don't have it in all their cars. But they didn't uh, develop anything of their own in the interim. Like they could have said, oh, okay, we don't want Apple CarPlay, but we're going to do it ourselves, but they didn't bother. Elon Musk is saying that the new version of the uh, full self-driving beta nine is almost ready and it is pure vision. And that does to say it's just using cameras with artificial intelligence de deciphering what those cameras are seeing with huge improvements. And he says, when radar and vision disagree, which one do you believe? 
Vision has much more precision, according to Elon, which might, you know, go against what uh, common sense might tell you. Uh, so better to double down on that vision than to do censure fusion. Uh, I'm a little confused by that because of a... Uh, if radar tells you there's an object 10 feet ahead, then damn it, there's an object 10 feet ahead, right? I mean, you don't have an AI to, you don't want to hit that object. So explain this to me, Brian. I think it's going to work, but I mean, obviously I don't really know, but um, here was a description that, that had it make a lot more sense to me. So you know how we have two eyes, right? And yes. this is how we get our depth perception, right? Because the two eyes are offset a little bit and you can use that to judge distance. But there's a lot of birds out there, a lot of animals that have their yeah. eyes on the sides of their heads. So they're not actually seeing the same thing with each eye. And yet they can still things. sense depth. So um, what they've figured out is that they can use other ways to sense depth. Like LIDAR or radar is really good at sensing depth. But if you take the map that the radar is making or the LIDAR is making and you compare it to the video that you're getting, you can calibrate your video so that it does the same thing. So that's why I think it's going to work. Brian, that was amazing. And that's why I enjoy <laughs> What Do You Think? What do you think? Well, let's move on to some feedback. Uh, yeah, the bird thing came out of, it came out of nowhere. Pretty impressive. That's, that's <laughs> why we have What Do You Think every week. <laughs> we actually had a Facebook post shared, Brian. No one uses our Facebook page. You know, uh, someone says, I've listened to quite a few episodes. They shared it to their friends and said it's fabulous. Uh, they they tagged their friends and said, you should listen to our show. Uh, they don't know me. Uh, I think you will both really enjoy it. Uh, from two Regina folks uh, who walk the walk of solar and electric-powered lives and provide reliable researched information regarding renewable energy. Wow. Again, more pressure. Fantastic, though. That's That's great. Ah, yes. Well, um, another great show this week, says somebody on Twitter. Uh, FYI, I will take the risk of the AstraZeneca vaccine too. Mm, I don't think it's a risk. Do you? The, uh, it, it has been reevaluated. Uh, so, yeah, here in Canada, apparently they are going to, uh, they've, they've decided it is now okay again for people under 55. So it sounds like that's going to uh, go through and, and get it to more people. Uh, yeah, but they said another great show this week. People like our show. I don't, now that gives That's me amazing. more pressure. If they hated the show, it'd be like, I could just show up. But now it's like, yeah. well, we better have a good show. Now we got to try. Have, yeah. That's, that's the hard part. Uh, Brian, I missed this one from Mike on Twitter a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about Atmos. We should have an Atmos corner. Yeah. <laughs> that's a sound, um, system from Dolby that people can have in their homes and in theaters that is immersive rather than directional as it places the sounds in a 3D area in front of you. And he says, your AirPods Pro, Brian Stockton, have Atmos capability. And he recommends that you, Brian Stockton, listen to The Mandalorian with your AirPods. He says it's unreal. It may not be technically Atmos, but it does the same thing. So... Are you willing to give that a try just for a second? I will give that a try. I have a problem with my AirPods in that they really don't fit in my ears and they fall out, which is, you know, I told a story a few weeks ago or one of them yeah. popping out. So my problem is I can't keep them sealed in my ears. Like in order for them to sound good, you've got to, the little rubber tips create a seal, but they keep slowly, you know, moving out. So I have to keep jamming them back into my ears for them to sound good. So I usually mostly just use them for... Zoom calls for recording the podcast, for listening to podcasts, you know, when the audio quality isn't as important. But Brian, they cost $350 or well, how much were they? Yeah, about $350, but uh, you know, I use them almost every day for, you know, those things I just mentioned. So they get a lot of use. Have you looked it up? Do other people have these problems? Is there a solution? Is there a different ear cap for them? Yeah, well, it's a common Apple problem. Like ever since they started selling these earbuds, there are some people like me who just, I just have the wrong shape of ear. Like a lot of people have a little notch in their ear. If you look at the, the, somebody's ear and the ear pod or the ear buds, they just sit in that notch. I don't have a notch. They're just open. So the only way to keep them in is to jam them into your ear, which is very uncomfortable. So I, I was thinking of launching a class action lawsuit against <laughs> Apple because every time, you know, you, I, 
I've had to buy like three or four pairs of these every time you buy an iPod or a phone or something. They give you these damn earbuds that I can't use. One more thing, I had to buy these extra little hooks for uh, my AirPods so that they, uh, here, I'll hold it up so you can see it, but you buy these little aftermarket hooks and you slip them over the ear pods and it, 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 uh, braces them against the inside of my ear and, and helps them, uh, not to fall out, but it still doesn't help with that seal I was talking about. But it keeps them on the ear, kind of where your glasses would sort of go on the top of your ear yeah. between the scalp yep. and the ear. Well, aren't we a, a diverse show? Um, <laughs> Don on Twitter says cycling is 10 times more important than electric cars for reaching net zero cities. Uh, even if all new cars were electric now, it would still take 15 to 20 years to replace the world's fossil fuel car fleet. And I saw, and maybe we'll get to this later, I, I somewhere in my script here, I have that there's a place that is giving you $3,000 to scrap your car in Europe to turn it into an electric bike. It wouldn't necessarily work for everyone here, but those are places where that's not a bad idea. You know, if you, uh, there's, there's just ways of getting those cars off the road faster than 15 to 20 years. Uh, BC has a scrap program, for example, your thoughts. But yeah, I think, you know, we don't think of it as often because of where we live. We have, of course, five months of hellacious, horrible winter. And technically, you can still cycle here and people do it. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. there are some people that switch to, you know, studded winter snow tires uh, for their bikes. But it is fairly impossible. There's no way I'm cycling for the five months of horrible winter. <laughs> And I want to get back to the EV tax that got applied to where we live in Saskatchewan, Canada last week. It is the first tax of such kind in Canada. And we have the least EVs of anyone in Canada for the most part, 400 for a population of 1.1 million, uh, raising a grand total of $16,000, which will fix exactly one pothole. And there is no EV incentives here. And um, Joel Murray, uh, former city councillor, uh, brother to my hairstylist, Todd, <laughs> by the way, um, says he drives a Model 3. Um, it's notable that the tax is exempt for natural gas-powered vehicles. There's, I'm guessing there's a lot of natural gas-powered vehicles and some fleets around here, and they're not getting taxed because we are a petro state. Yeah, well, you may want to, uh, you know, turn on your blood pressure monitor to uh, test this as we continue talking about it. But, um, yeah, it's a... It's a $60,000 line item on the budget, which is ridiculous. It's going to cost more to administer than they're actually going to uh, collect. But uh, yeah, it was, I think, important to sort of talk about again because, uh, you know, this, this, uh, there were some protests by local electric vehicle enthusiasts and, and this made national news in Canada because, as you say, this is the first tax of its kind uh, in Canada. And I do think taxes like this are likely inevitable. You know, we've got to pay for roads and everything. But, you know, this is clearly, um, we have a pro-pollution government. They won't come right out and say that, but it turns out they are in favor of pollution, and that's, this is how they uh, demonstrate that. Okay, I don't want to alarm anyone, but I am now going to take my blood pressure, and I want to assure everyone that I took it before the show, and it was fine. I am being treated for blood pressure, and I do monitor at home, but I will now press the button and uh, do a Should blood pressure about- reading. Something calming, or or do we actually, you know, we want to get you riled up and see how we want to get me riled up. They're not taxing the natural gas vehicles, Brian. Why is that? No, and I will point out as well, they're not taxing farm trucks. Farm trucks have Ah. been exempt from the provincial fuel tax for years now, which is something like a one hundred and ten million dollar gift to people who drive farm trucks. They don't have to pay this uh, tax at the pump. Oh my God. I have a reading for you. Tell me. It's 149 over 110. That's not good. <laughs> That's not good at all. I actually better calm down. <laughs> <laughs> That's... That's how angry the government makes me. Terrible. Well, I recently purchased my own blood pressure monitor, so maybe this could be a regular segment of the you show. Don't, we'll see. You don't get mad like me during the show. I'm always getting mad. Uh... <laughs> well, you know, it is a, I don't know, like... Uh, you know, you and I have been following this kind of stuff, clean energy, since we were kids in the 1970s. I was reading about solar panels in Popular Science magazine, 
And, you know, we've been waiting and waiting for decades for this future to arrive, and it's finally here, and it just never in a million years occurred to me that our governments would oppose it. You know, we're running out of time. We, we've, we've hardly, <laughs> yes, we, we've hardly we got anything get... here. I may not have more pl- time to check my blood pressure. I think maybe I'll I'll uh, I'll tweet out my blood pressure an hour after the show's over, and uh, just to reassure our listeners that I'm not dying. <laughs> okay, yes, Brian, please. you also wanted to talk about um, the French are talking about banning short haul flights. That's news to me. Yeah, this has already happened. Um, they have abolished domestic flights in France on routes that can be covered by train in under two and a half hours, and this is part of their. Uh, reducing carbon emissions. If they're going to meet their targets, this is one way that they're going to do it. And uh, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. We we probably shouldn't be flying in big, ridiculous no. uh, airplanes for for short flights like that. Um, I don't know. We have our two cities are about two and a half hours apart by car, uh, but people sometimes do fly between those two cities, and it amazes uh, me. we got to stop that. Yeah, I, th- I assume it's business flights uh, or people who can't drive. We don't have a bus system anymore here. But certainly in Europe, where there's all kinds of train service, uh, it it makes sense to do that. I don't see that that's going to inconvenience anyone unless you get train sick. Yeah, no, the train service in Europe is, is generally really good. So, um, you know, I would probably have been doing this anyway if it were me, but... Um, you know, you got to make rules for these sort of things so that, uh, to make sure people do it. So the, um, I also wanted to talk about something that made me angry. I was arguing with my son. My son, um, realized he drives the EV to high school. He knows solar panels work. We have them on the house on the camper. And yet he's very kind of pro nuclear. Uh, and I'm thinking, you know, we just watched Chernobyl. Did you learn nothing? Uh, it's, uh, it's, I don't know. So our, our governments here in Saskatchewan, the, the three anti-carbon tax provinces that didn't want to sign up for the carbon tax and just lost the Supreme Court case, forcing them to do that, uh, which is where we got the EV tax from, you jackass, you petty jackasses. I'm going to take my blood pressure again. No, I don't want it. It's only going to go higher. I have to calm down, Brian. I certainly, I have to make it through the show. Maybe not next week's show, but this week's show. Anyway, so they are touting, because it's not hippie wind and solar small nuclear today they've announced that they are wanting to go further and our federal government is somewhat behind this too they wanted to invest money as a backup they say it's not the solution um but small nuclear is not actually i think there's a russian ship that's doing it but there's no actual deployment of programs here i think there's one in the states that's hoping hoping to go online in 2030 they do tout that when you know, they have this technology down and, and it's been tested and used that they can deploy it in two years. Um, and it can be very small. It can be as small as the solar farm we're getting an hour south of where we live. Uh, it can be uh, uh, five megawatts, it can be 30 megawatts, you know, it can be, be different sizes. Uh, the idea is that you could put it in the far north where they're using diesel generators up in the Arctic of Canada. Uh, but those communities actually don't want nuclear. You <laughs> know, yeah. They they would rather something else, thank you, and they they don't want that to be forced on them. But our petro states here are wanting to use it for the oil sands to reduce the, it takes a lot of energy to heat the oil underground to, to uh, get the oil out of the sand and it's why it's not going to be viable once the market share goes to electrified transportation. Uh, I'm not convinced of it. I mean, I'm my my idea is that my my status of thinking is I'm not against nuclear if it's what it takes to save the damn planet, okay? Yeah. However, it's increasingly clear, based on what you've heard on our show over the last year, that it's probably not necessary uh, because it is more expensive and it is questionable and um, they've got a lot of things to work out. And by the time they do, it sounds like it'll be at least 2030, 2035, or 2040. And by then, we know the curves of price decline on solar and batteries the only question is battery supply uh we're we're talking current technology not even improving technology on the battery storage front there's also hydro storage uh and and things like that there are other options i i i I think this is like us buying a a monorail i'm worrying that our taxpayer money is going to get thrown at something unnecessary 
for ideological reasons because they're not really grasping that they see wind and solar as intermittent. Yeah, the sun goes down, so I guess we're swooped there. We're not. <laughs> there are solutions to 100% solar and wind, and uh, we've talked about them on the show, and the, the price declines are practically free. Yeah, well, when these discussions started, I don't know. I mean, the, the sort of buzzword in the clean energy circles a few years ago was always, it's going to take many, many different things to solve this problem. It's, you know, it's going to take wind, it's going to take solar, it's going to take hydro, it's going to take nuclear, like it's going to take all of these things. But as we have learned from Tony Siba, that's actually not true anymore, I think. Solar, wind, and batteries, that's all you need. It's going to be the cheapest, and anything else is going to be uh, a waste of money. And I think you're right. It's probably 2030 before any of these come online. And um, if we think Tony Siba is right, and we think that he is, you know, solar, wind, and batteries is going to be 70, 80% cheaper then than it is now. So, um, you know, anything, it's not going to take many different things. It's just going to take solar, wind, and batteries. They assume that because you don't have trucking, long haul trucking, that it's not going to happen in 10 years. They assume that because EVs only go four or 500 kilometers now, that they're not going to go further if necessary, which is questionable. You know, the faster they charge, the less battery you need for range. And um, that speeds up. It's just, there's, there's so many things where they look at now and they, they don't even know what now is. They may have an idea of what a few years ago was. But a lot of these politicians aren't even up to date on what is current, let alone yep. what is in two years from now, and let alone even less what the trend is uh, by the end of this decade. So I, this is something that I worry about. I'm okay with nuclear if that's what it takes to save the planet, um, but I'm not convinced it is necessary. It's only if necessary. And is it necessary at the price? Uh, and we were talking about levelized cost of electricity. Yeah, are you including uh, the disposal of the waste? It has to be stored for 100,000 years. Are you including that in the price of your levelized cost of electricity when you are comparing um, certainly uh, the lowest cost possible uh, on the spectrum of uh, modular nuclear is uh, a little more than what solar is now? Well, guess what's getting cheaper? Solar is getting cheaper, 60% cheaper uh, if you ask the Biden administration by 2030. Uh, who knows? Yeah, it, it, um, when you have this technology that you know works, Solar, wind, and batteries, we know already that it works, even if it costs twice as much as the nuclear, uh, just the safety aspects alone would probably suggest that we go that route anyway. It's, it's, it's here, it works, we just need more of it. Brian, out of time necessity, it's time for the lightning round. The Clean Energy Show lightning round. Oh my goodness, we have to move quickly this week. The Tesla semi-electric trucks or to power long hauling program in Canada and Mississauga. They've hired a service technician there. Is it for Walmart? We don't know. Also, they've hired service technicians for electric semis by Tesla in California, Nevada. Any thoughts on this one? Yeah, we're getting close, I think, to semi production. Uh, Tesla is going on this long, unending hiring spree, it seems. They're just hiring people all over the place. But, um, yeah, and Tesla's going to use their own semis to go between Fremont and Nevada. So uh, I don't know. We're, we're getting close to production. That's all I know. It'll be nice to see if they do do a Walmart or a Loblaws grocery store chain uh, in a cold climate. And that's one of the first things that goes off the ground because I think that will prove to a lot of people, including a lot of the idiots who are running our country. Polestar has set itself a moonshot goal to create a climate neutral car by 2030. Uh, this could be a boon for battery metals, m battery metals, aluminum and steel, and produced in Canada with low emissions. So they're talking the whole car will be neutral like, yes. in terms of making it. And yes, yeah, that's the mining, fantastic. And, the mining and everything. I don't know if they'll do it. That is their goal. Tesla hikes solar roof price dramatically on contracts signed over a year ago. Uh, it was much as fifty percent higher. Yeah, this is a bad look for Tesla. They've been trying to convince people to uh, pay more than the, the quote that they were given. But the, the, there is apparently a line in the contract that says, you know, this is an estimate. And when we get to actually doing your roof, it might be higher. Uh, unfortunately, it has been a lot higher. And uh, yeah, that does worry me for the, the deployment of the Tesla solar roof. It seems like a really great product. But, you know, the hope was that it would be an 
uh, cost effective product. But, you know, now as these prices are creeping up, you know, that may not be the case. This may be a roof for rich people. Yeah, and uh, it's durable and all that. It's cool, and it's good for maybe uh, backup power and hurricanes and places like that. However, I'm kind of against rooftop solar, uh, just because I've come around on the it's not the best way to spend money subsidizing people. I'm sure it'll be cheap when it's cheap enough for everyone to do it themselves, um, but you're still subsidizing the, you know, eventually it'll be cheap enough to do it with a battery, and you won't have to subsidize the tariff of the feed-in tariff. Um, but it's better to build a damn solar farm to take your yeah. power as a utility and build a solar farm instead of spreading it out and wasting the money on rooftop. Uh, you and I did it. We got a nice little rebate on it and it worked out well, but we did it when there was no solar farms. It was, it was pit. We were pissed off that there was no solar. So we took matters in our own damn hands and did it ourselves. There's my blood pressure. But calm down. you just have to have a solar friendly policy and then you, you're increasing the capacity of the grid and not costing you anything like you don't have to have a subsidy for it just let people in the grid let them have their power meter that runs forward or backwards and that's enough incentive for people to and then you know the grid gets kind of extra capacity out of it for essentially no cost to the utility shell is converting gas stations in the uk to ev charging stations that is not to say that they are adding ev charging stations to a gas station it is to say the gas station part is gone, and they're all just EV chargers. This is what this is the future. I tweeted this out on my uh, personal J.E. Whittingham uh, Twitter feed. Shell's converting these gas stations, and they're saying in two months we'll have no more gas at this station, just EVs. Uh, that's what the future is going to look like. So you want to look at the future? Look at that picture. You're going to see a lot of that, and you're going to have. I I'm the only one saying this, Brian. At some point in the future, in this decade. I believe you will have trouble finding gas for your car, that it will not be, that it'll be a question of, you know, do we have enough gas stations? Because they're such a, a margin, a thin margin operating that when less, you know, you cut out 30% and that's of people uh, driving gas cars and, and, you know, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. Right now it's always a bit of an issue planning a road trip in an electric car, but yeah, by 2030, it could be the same problem with uh, gas cars uh, opposite because by then there'll be plenty of charging stations. Uh, we have to go really fast. Permit filed for Hawaii's first public Tesla supercharger about 10 miles from downtown Honolulu. I'm a big fan of Hawaii. Where do you stand in Hawaii, Brian? Love it. Love Hawaii. Ireland to build the Atlantic's first floating offshore wind farm. My son tells me that the ocean around Vancouver and Vancouver Island is very deep. And that's one reason why they don't have a bridge there. And um, he, I said, well, there's such things as a floating wind farm. So maybe a floating wind farm is something we could look at it from up there. Tesla started advertising its Model 3 with 93 miles of range. That's 150 kilometers on its website in Canada. It used to be an off-menu item that uh, allowed them to get the sort of the rebate in Canada, uh, do you think there's any meaning to them putting it on their webpage now? Is it, are they forced to do it or is it, they don't want to sell that mm. car. That's my, my 10 year old leaf is like that. No, I read an article that they asked somebody in a uh, Canadian government for a comment and they did confirm that it was only voluntary, but it's something like, you know, we do talk to our partners in this program to make sure that they, you know, so it was, it sounds like it was strongly suggested to Tesla that they, put it on their website. But yeah, this relates to the EV subsidy that we were talking about at the beginning of the show. In order to qualify for the federal rebate, you have to have a starting price of 45000 or less. So yeah, Tesla, in order to qualify, created this software locked version. It's locked to 151 kilometers and it's for sale. And apparently a few people have bought them. I saw a figure like they've sold like maybe, I don't know, it was a couple of dozen or maybe a hundred of these. So people have actually bought them. Uh, I don't know why, because it's for another five or six thousand dollars more. You can get the one with the the proper range, but um, it's at least it's yeah visible on the website now. It used to be you had to phone them. The cars come with the actual range is software limited, so maybe they're just being hopeful that you know down the road they'll have a better job and some help can pay. But Elon has said no, they're not going to do that. Yeah, they've they've said from the beginning there will be no future unlocking of this uh, range, but uh, we'll see. Uh I think it's still possible. Analysis finds 77% of directors on boards of seven U.S. banks 
have ties to climate-conflicted groups as uh, banks continue to finance projects like the Line 3 oil pipeline. Uh, banks are pretending that they're good, but they're not. I'm just going to keep moving on, Brian. Audi unveils production version of the e-tron Q4 electric SUV with over 300 miles of range. That's 480 kilometers to you and me in Canada. And it is basically a higher-end VW ID4. However, the saying, you're not getting a lot more for the amount of money more that it costs. Um, yeah, I've got a friend who wants to buy an Audi. He's, he's misguided. Misguided man. Yeah, the price is quite high, isn't it? Yes, it is. The Boring Company has posted its initial estimates as we wrap up the show this week on how much it will cost to drive your car in the Vegas underground loop that Elon has made with his big boring hole company. And it is uh, approximately $5 a car. And uh, yeah, up to 15 bucks, depending on how far you go. So Ly- Lyft is charging a little bit more than that for the same route but you have to go into traffic and it takes longer. And so, yeah, you will have to pay the use the route there. Yeah. So this is basically a subway tunnel that runs with, with Tesla cars. So it's, it's a sort of a personalized subway that eventually will be autonomous. That's it for this week's show. Brian, we'll be back next week with another edition of the clean energy show where we will discuss the latest in clean energy and transportation been a great show fun talking to you and we'll see you next week see you next week